36 teams of two went out ahead of Jesus. You are lambs among wolves, he told them in a warning. And with that in mind, travel light. No purse, no bag, no extra sandals. Travel quick. Don't stop to greet anyone along the way. These were untrained, ordinary people. And yet Jesus resourced them very well with power from on high to heal all of the sick, to trample on scorpions and snakes. None of the enemy's power would overtake them. Nothing will harm you. Jesus promised them. And nothing did. And the message that he had them memorize was short and simple. Whenever you enter a town or a village, say to them, the kingdom of God has come to you. One sentence sermon. And yet do not discount its power. Just look at what was going on. This enormous wave of wellness that preceded Jesus through these 36 people or these 36 teams. And that as they proceeded over the plains of Galilee from city after city, this, now the blind can see. Now the deaf can hear. Now the demons flee and, and they're People are restored to health and wholeness. How could people not then wonder among themselves? What is going on? And the answer at the ready to give, the kingdom of God has come near. And as the king of the kingdom made his way to all of the towns that surrounded, that they'd already been there, he agreed that, yes, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more. For I have seen Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Rejoice! Your names are written in heaven. But of course, not everybody welcomed the teams of two. In some cities, they did have to wipe the dust off their sandals. And a warning to the residents that the kingdom of God has come, but you have not welcomed it. And it will not bode well for you on judgment day when the king himself comes. And it was true. When the king arrived, he said to the citizens, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! A stern warning from Jesus was sounded at all of the people who would not believe but had experienced all of these amazing and, and signs and wonders, even his hometown base of Capernaum, he asked of them almost rhetorically, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Well, why wouldn't they believe? With such a Dramatic display, overwhelming display of supernatural power on evidence before them. Healings, exorcisms. But they would not. If you saw all of those signs and wonders, you would believe, right? Maybe. But then again, maybe not. Think about in those moments that you've really struggled with belief and unbelief. When, when you've really had your questions and, and you've been in the darkness of your doubts and God seemed so absent, so far away and the, the promises that you've heard in the Scripture just were not being fulfilled at all and you, you really just had to wait on him if in that moment you saw even a parade of people who had been miraculously healed and were all exclaiming it's a miracle I can see again I can walk again I mean you would be happy for them I'm sure but how would that really change your own personal outlook of faith and unbelief 
I mean, it happened for them, but it hasn't happened for you. See, before you, you give too big of an answer of, of, well, I would believe, and really need to know a little bit more about what unbelief truly is. And that unbelief is not simply an absence of belief. It's not a, not a void of belief. No, unbelief has an active power in the heart and in the mind. So, keep in mind too that this is an enormous power. So that when you hear in your doubts... And you feel in your heart that this God is so far away. And someone were to quote to you some scripture. Say, well, the Lord is our shepherd. We'll have no wants. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. And you hear such platitudes as a platitude. It's like, well, I'm not feeling it. I'm not experiencing it. And so it's discounted. Or maybe you, you have something more dramatic. Like somebody shares with you a personal story of, of a healing that was beyond coincidence, that God's hand was involved, it was miraculous. Or someone shares with you a, 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 some kind of miracle or, or revelation or prophecy and, and you, you just kind of stare at them and you kind of wonder, are they just making it up? You kind of consider the source, you know, do they talk this way generally? and. You really kind of put it in the category of fake or forged or fantasy. You know, surely there has to be another explanation, even the placebo effect, you know. And to be honest and upfront, it very well may be faked and forged. There, there very well may be, may be a, a better explanation than, than God healed me instantly because we know that people they make up stuff. And, and we know that you, you, you can't always trust people because maybe they're trying to take advantage of you, manipulate you. Maybe they're trying to make some money off you by selling a book. See, that the thing about the scams and the deceivers is that it only strengthens unbelief's power in the heart because now you, you have some really good reasons for your skepticism. You know, people lie. People make up stuff. In fact, even if you were to have an experience for yourself in which you could see and touch that is designed to give you faith, even that may not still have the power to overcome the power of unbelief. One of the most striking, if not stunning, examples is in Matthew chapter 28. Keep in mind, this is the last chapter of Matthew. Jesus has risen from the dead. He has spent 40 days with his disciples. During that time, if you were to kind of add them up, there's like 12, 13 different encounters of Jesus with his disciples in which he's allowing them to, well, put your finger right here. Put your head in my side. Do you have any fish? Let's eat it together. He's teaching them. He's... He's being with them. They, his body is on evidence before their eyes. His familiar voice in their ears. And yet at the end of this 40 days, here's what Matthew chapter 28 says. He says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Unbelief is a power beyond human mastery. And the reason that it has such an enormous power is that there is a reason beneath the reasons that we give for not believing. Many people reject Christianity because, well, it's just the rules are too hard. You know, I, I don't want God restricting me. I don't want God telling me what to do. I just, I don't want any of that. And so they say, I don't believe any of it. Some people, for the exact opposite reason, say, when they hear the gospel that Jesus has forgiven all of your sins, it's too easy. No, I don't want any of that. I, I should take responsibility for what I've done. 
All of these different reasons. Oh, that person's just making it up. Oh, the Bible was written so long ago by people. How can we really know it's accurate and reliable? See, there is a reason, though, underneath and out of view of the reasons we give for unbelief. And its power is drawn from that reason. See, the power for unbelief comes from the heart that says, I won't. I won't believe. Think of it. If the kingdom of God has truly come near you, then that means you're not the king of your kingdom or the queen of your kingdom. If the kingdom of God has truly come, then my wants, my ways, my self-concerns will have to be set aside to the wants and the concerns of the one who now is in charge. If there is a king, then I will now have to entrust myself to his care. I'll have to trust his proclamations. I will have to put myself on a waiting list for him to provide. And the heart says, I won't do that. There is only one who is greater than the I won't of the heart, and that is Jesus himself. But Jesus doesn't overpower us. Love does not coerce. It, it's not its operating system at all. Love does not coerce, but love invites. The kingdom of God has truly come. And the invitation is extended to all, the entire world, without exceptions. To everyone in the room, the kingdom of God has come. But Jesus doesn't say, you better believe it or else. His invitation is love's tender, now you can. Now the power is available to believe. Now there truly is one trustworthy. There truly is one who's telling the truth. It is as sure and certain as the death and resurrection of Jesus. The woes and the warnings still need an answer, though. The woes and the warnings are of Jesus, the Savior, who his tears are down his cheek as he considers those who will not. As he looks at Jerusalem and he's weeping and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I long to gather your children like a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. See, love is the invitation but the tears are there because Jesus knows the truth that there is only destruction outside of his kingdom. And it is coming to those who are outside. It is the, the cry of a parent who sees their beloved child running out into the street with traffic coming. And they say, stop! The message of Jesus is be turned and live. And everyone who listens to the message listens to Jesus. And everyone who listens then to Jesus listens to the one who sent him, the Father in heaven. And the Holy Spirit then takes the message and where and when he wills, gives faith, strengthens faith. Faith comes by hearing the message of Christ. And this has a very important and practical um, way that it, it helps us in our day-to-day -day life. Because you who sit here, most of you already have a faith. You have an understanding that there is a God and that He has a Son, Jesus, and that He's died on the cross and He's risen again. And yet each and every one of us, pastors included, deal with the power of unbelief in our hearts. That there still is the, well, I won't of the heart entrust everything, not all of my time, not all of my money, not all of my attention. The I won't. And the cure isn't to 
have some kind of experience or to force it with power. The heart is only changed. It's only cure. It's only healing is the one Jesus. And that being with Him, there is finally the invitation even to the depths of our heart that cries, I won't. And the Jesus taking our hand and saying, but now you can. Come with me. For your names are written in heaven. You can rejoice. The one greater is in you. The one greater than the world. The one greater than your heart. In our day-to-day -day life, belief and faith are found in Jesus. Jesus, keep our hearts close to yours. Amen. Our